Throughout much of the world, police are trained in many things, using firearms, controlling crowds, protecting evidence, testifying in court, and interrogating suspects. Where did you find the piece of resistance? The piece of what? But when it comes to interviewing witnesses and victims, it appears they have been, well, lacking. Hey everyone, welcome back to Bear It In Mind. We have been exploring the topic of memory and specifically the psychology behind eyewitness testimony. And in previous videos, we've looked at how misleading information and anxiety can affect the accuracy of eyewitness testimony. The liar! Look here, you mess! However, even though the quality of an eyewitness's statement is of crucial importance, police have often been provided with very little training on the most effective interview techniques that help an eyewitness to retrieve those memories. I watch a lot of cop shows on TV. <laughs> Isn't there supposed to be a good cop? In fact, one experienced judge has stated that incorrect eyewitness identifications have led to more miscarriages of justice than all other factors combined. So, what has psychological research discovered about the best way to interview eyewitnesses? This brings us to the cognitive interview. The cognitive interview is a questioning technique designed to improve the information that an eyewitness can retrieve about a crime. It builds on well-established psychological research into the importance of cues on memory, something we've explored in a video on retrieval failure. You can check that out up here if you haven't already done so. This brings us to the work of Edward Geiselman and Ronald Fisher, whose names are going to appear quite a bit in the rest of this video. In 1984, Geiselman created a memory retrieval procedure for interviewing eyewitnesses called the cognitive interview. There are four parts to the cognitive interview. Let's explore each of them in turn. The first technique is to reinstate the context. This is based on Tulving's encoding specificity principle, which you may remember from the video on retrieval failure. This is where the cues available at recall need to be similar to the cues that were there when the memory was encoded. If we forget, it's because we lack the cues that were available when we learn the memory, when we witness the crime. Now, it may not be possible for the eyewitness to physically return to the scene of the crime, but they can try to return to the crime scene in their mind. They can do this first externally. This involves thinking about the surrounding environment at the time of the event. What did the room look like? What was the weather like? Were there any people or objects nearby? What sounds could they hear? And secondly, internally. This involves thinking about how they were feeling at the time and their reactions. This focuses on the psychological state they were in. Making use of all five senses can help provide lots of cues that might trigger the recall of certain memories. Perhaps at this point, you remember the research by Godin and Badley into context-dependent forgetting. No? Well, how about a cue to aid your recall? Remember now? The second technique is to report everything. The idea here is that the eyewitness is not to filter out or select what information to report. Anything and everything that they can recall from the event should be described. This is because, firstly, they do not know what may be important or not to the investigation, and secondly, it may be that some of those smaller, seemingly irrelevant details could trigger the recall of other more important memories. The third technique is to reverse the order. When asked to recall the sequence of events that you witnessed, you're naturally going to start with what happened at the beginning and tell the story to the end. However, there are two problems with this. Firstly, there is what psychologists refer to as the recency effect. This is where the most recent events that occurred are more likely to be remembered, which means the details from the beginning and the middle of the crime are more likely to be forgotten. Secondly though, there are the problems that come from schemas. As a reminder, schemas are organised units of knowledge that we have developed through experiences. They help us to make sense of the world so that we can predict what is going to happen and know how to respond appropriately. They are a framework through which we interpret information. However, schemas can potentially lead to errors with our memories because what we say we remember happening 
feeling may actually have been altered or changed to fit in with what we expected to have happened based on our past experiences. As Geiselman et al. in their research state, when events are recalled in forward order, some people reconstruct what must have happened based on prior knowledge of similar crime scenarios. Asking the eyewitness to reverse the order of events is designed to disrupt the effect of schemas and potentially lead to more accurate recall of events. The last technique is to change perspective. This involves the eyewitness trying to recall the events from different perspectives they've had as well as the perspective of others that were present during the crime. This technique is also designed to disrupt the effect of schemas and to help provide cues for the recall of other information. Following the work of Geiselman, Fischer et al in 1987 developed the interview further into what has become known as the enhanced cognitive interview. This reflected some additional key parts to be included in the interview which further enable the eyewitnesses to recall accurately. One of those factors was for the interviewer to build rapport with the eyewitness. As Fischer and Geiselman in 2010 wrote, victims are often asked to give detailed descriptions of intimate personal experiences to police officers who are complete strangers. Victims must be psychologically comfortable with the interviewer as a person to go through the mental effort and emotional distress of describing crime-related details. Police interviewers must therefore invest time at the outset of the interview to develop meaningful personal rapport with the witness. One piece of supporting evidence for the cognitive interview comes from the research of Geiserman et al in 1985. This involved the Los Angeles Police Department. Participants watched police training films of simulated violent crimes and 48 hours later they were then interviewed individually by experienced police officers. Here's what they found. The average number of correctly recalled details for the cognitive interview was 41.2 but for the standard interview it was 29.4 there was no significant difference in the number of errors in each condition. Further supporting evidence comes from the work of Fischer et al in 1989, this time with real life cases of robberies. In this research, seven experienced detectives from the robbery division of the Miami Police Department were trained to use the cognitive interview. This was compared with nine untrained detectives. All the interviews that took place with the victims and witnesses of crimes were tape recorded so that they could be later analysed. They found that the detectives trained in the cognitive interview produced 63% more information than the untrained detectives with over 90% accuracy. These two studies nicely demonstrate how the cognitive interview can lead to better memory recall in eyewitnesses over the standard interview. However, a meta-analysis carried out by Konkan et al in 1999 draws attention to one of the potential problems with the cognitive interview. They analysed 42 studies that in total involved nearly 2,500 interviews. Whilst they found that on the one hand the cognitive interview did lead to an increase in correctly recalled information, when the enhanced cognitive interview was used, there were more errors produced than the original cognitive interview. One limitation of the cognitive interview is that it's time consuming. This is because not only does it take much longer to conduct than a standard police interview due to the need to build up a rapport with the witness, it also requires time to train the police officers. In fact, one study asked police officers trained in the cognitive interview to rate how frequently they used it and how useful they found the different parts of the cognitive interview. One interesting finding from the study was that a major problem for many officers was that they do not have the time to conduct a full cognitive interview. So, despite the fact that the evidence points to the effectiveness of the cognitive interview, the time pressures and limited resources of the police can mean that the full cognitive interview is rarely used. If this video has got you excited about crime and forensic psychology and you would like to explore more, check out a couple of books that I've linked in the description below for you. I hope you found this video helpful and we'll see you in the next one.